Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I guess I'm still in a sports metaphor or analogy state of mind. I was about to attribute life is a game of inches to the great football coach Vince Lombardi until I realized he wasn't the one who actually said it. What Lombardi said was quite literal. Football is a game of inches. Yeah, okay. It took a screenwriter, John Logan, to turn Lombardi's words into an analogy and then bring it back to football via the character of Tony D'Amato in 1999's Any Given Sunday. The head coach of a fictitious Miami Sharks, D'Amato, played by Al Pacino, stellar and surprising cast if you don't remember or don't know it, check it out, delivers one of the great sports film's soliloquies of all time, beginning with, life is a game of inches, and so is football. But in either case, life is a game of inches are the words that immediately came to mind as I poured over images I shot last week with these two lenses. Sony's 135mm 1.8, made it to Sony's a7 III. Thank you, Sony, for the loaner. And Leica's full-frame Summicron SL 90mm f2 on my own 24 megapixel APS-C Leica CL. B&H, thank you guys for lending me the lens. Because while both setups are absolutely brilliant, super crisp, corner to corner, even wide open, no chromatic aberration apparent on first glance, really the best imagery I've ever seen at this field of view, though, hold that thought, I don't think you can consistently say one is better than the other in purely technical image quality terms. Specific use cases, sure, but not all of them. I've realized that the differences in these photographs almost inevitably came down not to the gear, but literally to a couple of inches or a few seconds. I'd shoot a second too early or late, not wait the extra second or two for autofocus to settle, inadvertently rotate an inch or three beyond axis as I switch from vertical to horizontal, leave the depth of field a bit too shallow by just two or three inches, and turn potential keepers into rejects, or move a few inches to the right and turn okay shots into better ones. Although, I was occasionally reminded that even the most advanced autofocus systems can still be dumb. I long for the day, and it will come when autofocus knows what it is seeing without me first having to menu dive to tell it what to look for. But that's a game of inches or seconds too, isn't it? Because if I'd taken just seconds to reacquaint myself with the details of the A7 III menu system, which when you think about it, leaves choices just inches, millimeters apart from each other on different screens, even now, the menu system still leaves me scratching my head, or an even shorter amount of time to tune the CL because its menu system is significantly easier for me to navigate. Or taking a few seconds to calculate that the depth of field of a 135, 1.8 at, say, 6 feet is only 7 tenths of an inch, and I might want more depth of field. You get the point. Although this may surprise you, and it certainly surprised me, IAF was on and I still had difficulty getting the Sony to focus on this little one. I actually had better success with the theoretically inferior autofocus of the CL. In hindsight, I'm thinking it may have been a function of minimum focusing distance, because while the 90 has a minimum focusing distance of 60 centimeters, the Sony's is 70. Oh, and this is a trip. I noticed for the very first time ever that when looking through an EVF with preview turned on, the aperture blades don't move at all. The image in both of these cameras simply simulated exposure without changing depth of field. I mean, I am friggin' stunned. With the Sony, you at least have the option of going into custom settings and assigning what's called aperture preview to a button, though it does slow everything down. The CL, best as I can tell, doesn't even have that option. It has simply never occurred to me that I wasn't seeing a proper depth of field preview these last few years of using EVF only cameras. Then again, our daily driver has been the Panasonic GH5 and it does preview exposure and depth of field. I was seeing proper depth of field preview. The only other times I've shot this shallow, at least in the past few years, were when I tested its little brother, the 85 1.4 G Master and shot last year with Leica M10P and M10D. With the 85 1.4, I wanted razor thin depth of field and shot wide open with results I just love. With the M series twins, I used the Type 20 EVF for critical focus with manual glass, 
when shallow depth of field was also an integral part of my street work. In these instances, of course I saw the actual depth of field because the aperture was actually adjusting as I turned the aperture ring. Holy <laughs> Moving on. I didn't bother with a bokeh test because I'm sure other reviewers have already covered it and because I'm fairly uninterested in it. If I shot at night, I might have seen the impact between the Sony's 11-bladed diaphragm compared to the eight blades of the Leica, but I might not have seen it either. Because in the real world, that's not where I'm looking. I use depth of field to isolate the subject, not the context. Or it simply wouldn't be significant if I were. I should at least check that, shouldn't I? Hang on. <sighs> yeah, no big difference in a sample size of one. I think life is especially interesting when you consider it as a long game, too, with bigger distances. A game of decades, a game of perspective. All the more obvious when you compare these lenses to the manual focus only 135 millimeter upon which I cut my teeth, the lens that led me to prefer 135 or 85, 105 or 200, although Nikon's AFS 105 1.4E is outstanding, Canon's early 1970s era manual focus only FD 135 25. My sister recently discovered carousel trays full of slides from that time, and I was stunned to see just how soft those Kodachromes and Ektachromes look. Though, to return to that thought I asked you to hold, I think it's fair to say that a mid-90s manually focusing only Leica Elmerit M90mm 2.8, like the one I bought for my 10 megapixel APS-H M8 and deeply regret selling, or the Olympus 75mm 1.8 we have for our 20 megapixel Micro Four Thirds GH5, are right up there with them, if not on an MTF chart, I haven't checked, certainly by eye at pretty much any size and appropriate viewing distances. Dramatically smaller, lighter, and less expensive, too. A clean manual-only focus Elmerit M of that same vintage, all of 484 grams, can be had on eBay for $1,000, give or take. A brand new autofocusing Oli 75 1.8 tips the scales at a petite 300 grams or so and is $900 new at B&H Radorama. Compare that to the 700 grams of the 5150 Leica, 950 grams of the less than half the price but still not inexpensive $1,900 Sony, or while we're at it, the stonking big 1130 gram but only 1400 buck Sigma 135 1.8. We'll come back to that pricing in a moment. I guess I could mention that the Sony 135 1.8 is a top of the Sony line G Master, big brother to our 2017 lens of the year, in fact, their 85mm 1.4. Which means beyond optics, it offers superb build quality and a real aperture ring, among other things. I don't mean to minimize its physical implementation. As I said earlier, it is superb. But while I generally prefer an aperture ring to no aperture ring, I certainly prefer a dedicated aperture ring to the currently in vogue, but I think it's just silly, customizable rings in place of an aperture ring. I can't imagine a workaday pro nor an enthusiast putzing with it other than to make sure it's set to aperture and forget about it. This time, I couldn't care less about a ring of any kind. Sony's are built, among other things, for speed, and dialing in the aperture via the rear control wheel is fast, certainly no slower than manipulating the aperture ring with one's left hand as the lens sits cradled in it. Ditto with the Leica, though Leica autofocus lenses don't have anything but a focus ring. I couldn't care less about the function buttons on the lens either, though the external auto manual focus switch is nice. I prefer the clean lines of the Summicron. No buttons of any kind. The Leica CL's menu system and ergos make it very quick to get to where I want to go, including dial in the aperture from the CL's control wheel. It's a cakewalk even for a curmudgeon like me. Then again, the CL is not weather sealed. The A7 III is kind of, but both lenses are. Which leaves us where precisely? Well, on paper, the Sony is the obvious value per dollar winner here compared to the Leica. It is less than half the price of the Leica, just half when you add in the bodies as well. 
four grand versus eight. Yet the A7 III still boasts a larger sensor, bigger battery, more sophisticated autofocus, in-body image stabilization, dual card slots, greater dynamic range, a one-third stop light gathering advantage, one and a third stops depth of field advantage with an equivalent field of view given the CL's 1.5 crop factor, blah, de, blah, 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 blah. But in the field, the Leica was faster to manipulate in my hands. It's almost 15% lighter at 1116 on my scale of battery card and strap versus the Sony at 1614. It felt much more solid, more discreet. It was more enjoyable for me, of course, your mileage may vary, than the Sony. I liked the CL's colors better straight out of camera, though it's close enough and easily correctable. And the APS-C CL gave up just about nothing in the real world in terms of image quality, or to my surprise, I admit, autofocus performance too. Though, yeah, it was in bright sunlight where contrast detect only autofocus systems do best. I did notice that the CL's EVF seemed dimmer than the A7III's, something I'd not noticed before and haven't replicated since. I'm wondering if it had to do with differences in heat management as it was a ghastly warm and humid day. And I definitely prefer the side-loading card slots of the A7III to the one card slot accessible on the bottom plate on the CL, which in turn means if you use it, I have it somewhere around here, yeah, unscrewing the optional grip first. More tedious than that, you'll have to go through the same thing when changing the battery, which you will do much more often than on the A7III. So, yeah, 4K extra is a lot to pay for the CL's advantages, even more to pay when you think about the things you give up in the process. But that's what it costs because the CL and Leica glass are assembled by hand in Germany in small production runs by people who are paid a living wage. I don't begrudge them that. Though you might well argue that four large is not a game of inches. For some of us, it might as well be a hundred thousand miles away as in, it ain't happening. And I'd agree. But that's just as true for people looking to scrounge up 4,000 altogether for the Sony setup. Which leads us to a couple of other things. First, that Sigma 135. I haven't tried it. It's even more of a beast, that much I can tell. It has a longer minimum focusing distance, 87.5 centimeters, but it's 1400 bucks, not 1900 or more than five large. Two, the combination I left at home, a Panasonic G9 with that Oli 7518. That kit would have given up essentially nothing in terms of light gathering, though it would surrender one and a half stops of depth of field relative to the Sony. Ironically, as with the CL, a good thing in this instance most of the time. Four megapixels and two bits worth of color depth to either of them that 99% of the people 99% of the time wouldn't notice or something like that. And would have weighed 10% less than the like. It cost half the price of the Sony and thrown in superior IBIS to the Sony, superior EVF to both. Even then, two grand is a lot of dosh to some of us. And I, I get that. I think you get it too, but hold that thought. Let's wrap it up this way. If value is your primary metric, this last combination, the G9 and the Oli 75, is the one to get among the three. If Leica floats your boat, you prefer the colors straight out of camera, the ergos, menu system, build quality. If you get a charge from holding in your hand a camera with the richest legacy of all, you know I understand that and you have the wherewithal, it is the one to get. Maybe with the Elmerit 90 if you're a purist. If having the most capable system across the greatest number of use cases is what you want at what I think is an unbeatable price to boot, or if you simply want to shoot fast-moving sports, hyperkinetic models who twirl a lot, or events, the Sony is the one to get. There's joy to be had from all of them. No shame in any of them. No shame in picking up a 1970 years Canon FTQL 35 millimeter film camera on eBay for 50 bucks either, along with that 135.25 for another 50, a couple of rolls of black and white film, and remembering both the rule of Sunny 16 if the meter doesn't work, and the wisdom of stopping the lens down to 5.6 or 8. It actually cleans up quite a bit and might help you slow down enough to willingly stretch those few extra inches or take those few extra seconds that really do make the difference. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from you. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. 
you find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second.